movement. But it never happened until this uh, sort of disaster. And uh, so there was not very, uh, not too many opportunities for bottom-up initiative or participatory program in this process. And very soon, the government asked for efficiency of this sort of relief program. And they asked the World Vision, which is a Christian uh, NGO, to help the community to establish their new homeland altogether. So here we have 132 households from Magazaya tribe, and 177 from Kuchapungan, and 174 from Dabaran. And all are sort of divided into three uh, sectors. And it's a very interesting uh, decision. I'll talk about that later. Okay, so um, the tribal communities are intentionally separated into three uh, living areas, and each area with three different churches. So in this compound, there are nine different churches. It's a really probably the densest uh, sort of uh, church community ever in Taiwan. It was really uh, something special that recently they tried to promote something like a wedding ceremony, uh, kind of a touristic uh, industry here. You know. um, uh, they only share one thing, it's a common a sort of elementary school. And this is uh, the house that was built very efficiently after the disaster. And it looks really European in a way. That has nothing to do with the sort of tribal condition. And there are two types of permanent housing in Dinali. And um, it, it is totally decontextualized. Mm -hmm. And all those planning and design is done by one uh, singular uh, architect. And so this is the new settlement. Uh, so um, they have very strong emotional attachment and deep memory with their original homeland. But here, this permanent housing is, uh, is a kind of a secular uh, territorial rightization uh, all from the start. And there's so many uh, debate uh, about their new identity, especially in naming, like how to name this place, how to name the street, in, in which tribal uh, uh, tradition, in which tribal uh, uh, identity. Uh, so there's so many conflicts, but then they have to establish a new alliance between three tribes to sort of negotiate uh, the differences, which is really a new thing. And uh, it's, it's probably too early to investigate now if it's really a successful program to put them all together and to start sort of a new tribe. And uh, it was interesting to see how the uh, indig indigenous community members started to appropriate uh, certain spaces immediately after the reconstruction. So the front porches, which is a really important uh, spatial element in the tribal community, they are very soon transformed into creative and productive spaces for individual households. And they started to make arts and crafts in those front porches. And uh, the, the, the sort of sharing indigenous community uh, because they are in this sort of involuntary uh, relocation context. And so uh, this new community, a mixed identity, uh, becomes a very difficult issue. Uh, they use very limited resources to express their identity. And sometimes it's confusing, because according to the tradition, some of the families are not allowed to decorate certain totems. But it's totally forgiven after the disaster. So the internal social structure is broken down uh, in almost less than a year uh, in all those sort of cultural expression. What we see here now is like different expression of households. And uh, if you go down there, you'll see very interesting and very beautiful uh, sort of tribal uh, cultural artifacts. But uh, uh, people are worried about the breakdown of this sort of cultural system. So that's how it's almost 20 minutes. Thank you. And uh, so this is uh, still going on right now, this collective and continuous transformation through the practice of everyday life. And there is an uh, argument by one of the tribal members of the Stavaran tribe. And he's an artist. His name is, uh, uh, we call him Dagi. And he, he argues the tribe is where your tribal people are. So they decide to stay here in this new territory. Uh, but if we compare with the other uh, sort of philanthropic uh, planning and design, this is uh, another project uh, 
planned and sort of uh, managed by a Buddhist. Well, actually, it's probably the largest Buddhist NGO in the world. It's Siji, uh, uh, and this is the village uh, that is uh, very, very clean and uh, homogeneous and controlled uh, uh, under certain religious ideology. And so the tribal members, you know, they are hunter tribes in the mountain. They they have to hunt to survive. But according to the Buddhist tradition. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes it's just so contradictory to their own belief. And they, they even uh, try to persuade the tribal members to go through certain rituals that is totally Buddhist. And uh, so there's certain conflict in this kind of living condition. And they didn't separate different tribes. So all the tribal members from different ethnicities are mixed in this compound. Uh, and then uh, I was, uh, we were able to secure some grant uh, from another foundation. Strangely, it's, it's a foundation from a very famous uh, martial art movie star called Jet Li. And <laughs> he's famous in China. <laughs> and in, <laughs> then, then he uh, established the foundation and then we decided to use the grant for just a few families to decide to return to the mountain, to the homeland at their own risk. And it's a long process, okay, so going back to the original homeland becomes a very conscious and intentional decision for this indig indigenous community. And uh, they, they started to talk about sort of a, a resistance model, uh, especially uh, cultural integrity uh, for the future generation. And so they have to uh, practice home education for the younger generation. And um, very soon, uh, with the money that we, we, we uh, uh, secure, uh, they, they are able to start this organic farming of millet, uh, taro, and other traditional crops. Uh, it's revived in the hillside of this damaged homeland of Dabran. And um, gradually, people are moving back. Now there are about eight different families uh, living in uh, this original homeland. And all the things that we see in this picture are some newly built or sort of restored uh, farmland. And they even uh, renew their harvest uh, festival, which has been gone for a long time or distorted for a long time by the nationalist state. And this harvest festival is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen uh, after uh, uh, the harvest. And uh, they are talking about not only, only uh, ecological sustainability, but also about cultural and uh, social sustainability, which is uh, very easily ignored in environmental sustainability uh, 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 discourse. Mm -hmm. And they, they argue the values of autonomy, and, and they have to uh, focus more on this challenge of home education, uh, because the kids have to practice uh, their mother tongue every day with their parents. Mm -hmm. This is the kids who could still speak the, the <coughs> language. And um, all the time they have to do really <coughs> trivial things in the farm, in the kitchen. But uh, it's a very critical decision right now. Some of the kids are in about 12 and 13. And they are thinking, should they you know, study physics, chemistry, mathematics, just like other kids in school? Uh, or should they just stay here in the mountains? Because they, they don't think it's it's okay to deprive this uh, opportunity for the kids for future uh, learning experiences. It's a very difficult decision right now. So uh, I'm trying to conclude uh, with this chart. So indigenous community in contemporary context, at least in Taiwan, uh, we are looking at different models. Some are able to retain the way it has been, but most of the time we have seen uh, they are blended into the larger uh, almost urbanized society, uh, even the sort of the Buddhist uh, compound. I'm looking at certain kind of, you know, emerging urbanity over there, the, the kind of mixed uh, and, and, and sort of damn situation. And but uh, also we, we have seen sort of top-down planned community and we're trying to differentiate the mixed or the divided model to see which one is actually more appropriate to retain sort of cultural identity uh, if we are looking at sort of differences between different ethnicities. 
And then there are certain urban squatter villages in the cities. They move into the city, but they are not able to acquire any housing. So they squat along the river bank. There are so many of them. This is another important issue, but I'm not able to talk about that. And then there's another issue here. Intentional community as a new indigenous community. Is it possible for, for us to rethink indigenous community in a different way? So this is my uh, final slide. It's about root or root. It's, a, it's the same uh, pronunciation for me, but uh, it is, it's very important to to keep your identity uh, within this sort of root uh, homeland. But then, should there be any way out of here to, uh, to, to be integrated or to be connected to the outside world? And uh, I, I don't know the answer, but uh, they are thinking in a more progressive way. I mean, the, the, the sort of intentional committee in the mountain now, they think uh, we are more open-minded than our ancestors. Uh, it's very possible that some of the uh, uh, sort of a voluntary uh, uh, migrants could actually participate in their new tradition in the mountains. So I think I'm going to conclude my uh, presentation with this slide and to share with you this very uh, uh, extraordinary, extraordinary experience for myself. Thank you very much.